Joining us today are Simon Viney, Cybersecurity Financial Services Sector Lead at VA Systems Applied Intelligence, and Brett Lancaster, Head of the Customer Security Program at SWIFT. There was a report released in the past week from SWIFT and VA Systems Applied Intelligence that talked about how cyber attackers cash out following large-scale heists. But before we get into that, I'd like to bring in Brett and Simon and give us a little bit of their background uh, before we jump into this. So, Brett, if you could kind of walk us through what you do day to day and uh, what you do at SWIFT. Thank you very much. So, uh, Brett Lancaster, Managing Director at SWIFT. So, my day job is to run essentially the customer security program, which for those that are not familiar, uh, the Bank of Bangladesh heist was about now four or five years ago, I guess, 2016. And SWIFT took the, uh, the, the big decision that we should help uh, protect the, uh, the ecosystem that we represent. CSP, Customer Security Program, is a multi-year, multifaceted program that does exactly what it says on the tin, helps to raise that level of cyber hygiene across all of our members and reduce the potential impact when there is a cyber attack aimed at uh, institutional payments fraud in the ecosystem. That's what I do as, as a day job. Uh, evening job, I'm also the chair of the ECRB Information Sharing um, Committee, which uh, helps to uh, share information across the 30 or so major central banks in, uh, in Europe. And Simon, what about yourself? Thanks, Brad. Yes, so Simon Viney, I'm the Cybersecurity Financial Services Sector Lead here at BA Systems Applied Intelligence. Uh, so I look after um, all of our cybersecurity work for our financial services clients globally. Uh, BAE Systems, we work with a, a number of banks, insurers, other finance organizations across the globe, uh, helping them uh, address cyber resilience challenges they have, uh, advising them on cyber threats that they face, and also the uh, sort of bridging the gap effectively between cyber and fraud. Great. Now, I'm going to pose this question to each of you. You know, if there were three or four takeaways from this report um, that was commissioned uh, by SWIFT and BA Systems Applied Intelligence participated in it, if there were three or four takeaways, what would that be for each of you, for either organizations or um, people that might be interested in this type of research? What would those be? Brad, I'll start with you. I think the, the biggest takeaway for me is, I mean, I, we know a lot about the cyber heist itself. So what happens when the threat actors get in and they penetrate, laterally pivot over and look for, in this case, the, the, the SWIFT payment system that's sitting in the middle of the back office of the, of the firm. We know a lot about that and the modus operandi and the TTPs and IOC, so we know a lot about that. But I must admit that I was... I was taken aback by the level of activity that essentially goes around that attack. So all the things that happened before in terms of the setup and all the things that happen afterwards, uh, that for me was, was, um, was a big takeaway that I wasn't expecting, the, the level of sophistication of all the things that happened before and after. That for me was a, was a biggie. Simon, can you speak to that? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, I just sort of just build on what um, Brett was saying there. Uh, the intention that we really wanted to get across and, you know, for me, the, that key takeaway was both that amount of preparation that actually goes into these large scale uh, cyber attacks. Uh, that, you know, there's an awful lot of work that happens in advance of almost actually some of the cyber aspects almost being thought about to some extent. Uh, and then, as Brett was mentioning, there's the sophistication that's sometimes put into the actual laundering process as well. And I guess the other point just linked to the money laundering uh, point is actually a lot of the techniques they've borrowed from historical uh, you know, money laundering techniques used in other criminal activities. Uh, it's to some extent not a new problem. Uh, they've reused what they've seen work elsewhere. Agreed. Agreed. So, Let's talk about the sophistication and the setup. Give us uh, a specific example that was mentioned in the report or may not have been included in the report that kind of shows you the scale of the setup before, during, and after, if you can kind of break that down into layman's terms. 
which also uh, Brad, one, one of the uh, interesting parts of, of what we called out in the uh, report was around actually some of the money mule recruitment activities uh, that happen to make sure so these mules you know typically then used in the laundering process uh, but actually people you know will get tempted by fake job adverts for example uh, and these job adverts will look you know legitimate as if they're legitimate companies that you're applying to get um, work for uh, you'll work remotely you'll look at the company website that will see, appear to check out you know some of the websites talk about diversity and inclusion type information for example you know they go to a fair amount of effort in pulling these together to fool people into thinking this is legitimate work whereas actually all you're then doing is ultimately helping to move money around between accounts as part of the laundering process so yeah in particular I thought that was one of the you know more interesting parts I, I completely agree actually I, that was uh, that was a shocker and I think the um, the other interesting aspect to this it's it's almost um, a neat join um, or very sophisticated IT uh, very, very, um, uh, very complex um, IT skills that you need to do some of this job, but then coupled neatly with you need physical bums on seats in terms of the money mills that will be walking around almost with a carry bag full of cash. And to marry those two, I think, rather distinct um, worlds, I think, just shows you the level of coordination and thinking that these threat actors and I guess the organized crime groups that go around them uh, use in order to uh, to do this, this cyber heist from end to end. It's not just a case of you need cyber skills. You need all the other things, as you say, quite rightly said, in, the, in terms of the enticement for the money mills up front. I think that was, for me, was really interesting, the level of coordination you need joining those two worlds, the physical world, people carrying money and throw out of ATMs as well as the cyber world. That was really fascinating for me. For those that may not understand money laundering, you know, there are three points that we lay out in the paper regarding placement, layering, and integration. Brett or Simon, I'll toss it up. Uh, who would like to address those and kind of walk us through those three steps? Yes, Brad, absolutely happy to take that one. Uh, so, yes, those three, three stages, you know, they're sort of the traditional money laundering, uh, stages effectively uh, placement layering integration in reality there's actually a fair degree of um, overlap between uh, parts of them you know placement is where the money initially finds its way uh, into the financial system uh, you know for an electronic uh, cyber attack where you know money's been transferred electronically um, you know you take the view that's the initial fraudulent transfer where we're talking about some of the ATM attacks that's where then the cash that's been extracted from the ATMs is then put back into the financial system, whether that be at a you know a money exchange or somewhere like that. Uh, and then the the multitude of techniques that go through the remainder of that, you know, following on from the initial placement through the layering and in integration is where the complexity comes, designed to make it, you know, very hard or and sometimes impossible to actually follow where the money has ultimately gone to. So you'll get things like money mules being involved, you know, transferring between accounts, uh, use of front companies, which, you know, appear legitimate um, at first glance, but are actually just uh, effectively almost operating as a shell or as a, a pseudo enterprise uh, with a, a side business of then effectively taking in, um, uh, taking in the money. And things like cash businesses um, obviously play a key part alongside that, that these criminals and um, threat groups use because they're, all, they're very easy ways then of being able to effectively process large amounts of cash uh, and uh, lose the traceability, which is ultimately one of the key things they're looking to do in this laundering uh, process. And then ultimately the integration is, you know, uh, actually how do they get access to the funds in the form that they want uh, to do what they want to do as a, you know, as a criminal group or as the uh, nation state threat group whether that's reinvest it for their purposes, um, and make it available for whatever objective they had uh, in the first place. And, go ahead, Brett. I thought, I thought just, to, just to build on that, I thought one of the interesting things out of it was um, that I was not aware of was that they're, they're heavy dipping into the cryptocurrencies as one of the means of getting the cash out. It's not just a case of get the cash in the local currency, get it converted using an FX exchange, but then the front companies I was aware of, but, but cryptocurrencies I was not. And I thought that was a really interesting and uh, perhaps um, kind of worrying um, advancement in terms of where these guys are going and the sophistication that they've got. 
yes, but I was going to say it's not something uh, you know in the report. I think we called it out. You know, it's still not the the uh, prime way of doing this, but it's you know it's certainly come along and um, you know one to watch for the future. I think as to how added complexity that can give. Is it fair to say that the rise of money mules and front companies continues to increase year over year? I think the uh, so for for the large scale you know sophisticated cyber um, heists that we're talking about here, I think the, these aspects have always been involved um, at the lower levels of you know I guess more general cyber fraud that actually aspects of what we talked about in the report uh, will still apply to even though that wasn't the focus of what we were researching. Um, yes, you know. I, as, as cyber fraud goes um, grows, you would you know expect to probably see a corresponding in, increase in mon money mules. Um, I can think you know people might sort of think uh, uh, individuals don't do this very often, but last time I actually went into a bank branch uh, here in the UK, uh, there were actually large posters up you know behind the counter saying don't don't become a money mule effectively. Um, lots of people are being tricked into giving access to their accounts. Um, or being tempted into saying, yeah, can you just take in this payment and pay it back out over here without realizing that's actually part of the criminal enterprise. You're not just doing somebody a favor because they say, oh, well, they've lost access to their account temporarily. You're part of a money laundering process and you have absolutely no idea where that money's ultimately going to and what purposes it's actually being used for. And I think that's a really, that's a really good point. And I think for me, you know, is it growing? Is it not growing? I, I don't, I don't have any stats on that, but I think you know, implicitly, um, given the large scale that we see, given the, the, the values of funds that are attempted, you know, whether they're successful or not is a different question. But I think because the size is there, I can't see these guys ever stopping. They will always want to push and probe. And we've seen, even in the cyber world, we've seen them evolve and move and change tools and and you know they, they kind of know what they're doing and i i fear that because the level of funds that they're trying to go for in these large-scale heists are are sufficiently big that i can't see these guys ever stopping now you could argue it's kind of the, the whack-a-mole analogy you push them down one <laughs> side and then they pop up somewhere else and i think that's probably fair and i think you know we're, we're trying obviously to raise the barriers and you know, that will obviously, from our ecosystem, will take some, some time to do across every single firm, across all our 13,000 members. But I think, you know, as you raise that bar, they will either try and look to hop over it or go around it, or if it does get too hard, then they'll simply go elsewhere and they will go and chase other things aside from institutional banking fraud so you know maybe maybe the cryptocurrency is a, is a good example or or those kind of exchanges is a good example because you know these guys these guys are really sophisticated and I, and I i am concerned that that we also have to kind of it's almost like the cat and mouse game you know it's the arms race analogy that you know as they get better we need to get better and whatever they do we almost try and need to be one step ahead and and that that for me you know, one of the reasons for bringing this up is this uh, this paper up is that we wanted to keep raising awareness across all of our customers and beyond our customer base that you know it's important. You should be aware of this, and we need to act in a coordinated way, you know, to defend these guys because because they, they kind of know what they're doing. By the way, I love the whack-a-mole analogy. That was brilliant. <laughs> so going from whack-a-mole to the evolution, you know, they're not going to stop. Um, at any time, anytime soon, how do we mitigate, or what are the potential mitigation tactics that can be used um, to prevent money laundering? You list some in the report, so if you guys can kind of walk through that in a very high level, what some of those mitigation techniques could be going forward? Yes, yeah, so, um, Brad, actually mentioned some of it there. You know, one of, one of the key ones really wanted to just highlight is that need for information sharing and collaboration. Uh, it's you know this isn't about one institution or even one country doing something in isolation. This has to be a collective effort, you know, across organisations and across jurisdictions to say how can we address this common global threat that we face. And so that improvement in actually aligning cyber and fraud and financial crime uh, teams, both within organisations, then between organizations in a jurisdiction 
and across jurisdictions, including law enforcement and uh, other industry bodies, etc., I think is key. Uh, one of the um, initiatives we called out in the report was around uh, the European uh, money mulling action, uh, where we talked around you know, some of the successes that it had in identifying uh, money mule accounts, uh, simply because information was being shared as part of that initiative that hadn't actually previously been shared. Um, and it's, you know, that quite often the information is there, the data points are there, if you can join the dots. It's very similar to the, you know, sort of cyber attack analogy. It's quite often a company finds itself, you know, a victim of a successful attack. And there would have been indicators within their security monitoring systems that this was happening. But people, you know, and the systems didn't spot them in a timely fashion. And so it's about being able to join all of that together and then take action off the back of it. I know, I totally agree. I mean, I think the other, maybe one or two items that I would add is, is, is compliance, and it's been around for a while, but making sure your account opening processes are good and you have the due diligence and you have the checking, make sure that's all squeaky clean, which, you know, um, maybe historically some jurisdictions didn't have or didn't have as, as effective as some others. So that, that will be obviously continued to push. And I think then where I started the, the whole conversation is where I sit now in the, in the customer security program at Swift, which is essentially to, to raise that level of cyber hygiene by, by instilling a set of controls that every single, of our, every single one of our customers must meet. And we make it mandatory. So if you want to be on SWIFT, you have to make sure that you comply with these controls. And uh, we will make you a test to your level of compliance every year. And you must meet the controls, the ones, certainly the ones that are mandatory. And if you don't meet them, then the stick that we have is that we will um, inform your local supervisor. And that tends to get uh, the uh, the oils wheeled, uh, the, the wheels wheeled, the, the, the wheels oiled, and um, we see a lot of then compliance for each controls across all of our ecosystem. So we're trying to continue continually push across each of these levers. I don't think it's a one uh, one size fits all. You have to come across all of these different facets and then, and do it in a coordinated way. But you know there is there is still, as we know, there is still work to do. And to that point, we don't want to give away the full report, so you're going to have to download it at the link below, or you can find it on the SWIFT website or the BAE Systems Applied Intelligence website. Just look for the Follow the Money report. Brett, Simon, thank you so much for your time. Fantastic research, and um, we look forward to talking again soon.